example, Quad OA in 2021, what they said a leak was in 2021 was different than what they said a leak was in 2022, which was completely different than what they said a leak was in 2023 for Appendix K. So as it relates to what we're doing, we were looking in the early terms and trying to do what we could to say, what could we do as a camera manufacturer to try and uh, help you as an operator meet these requirements from the EPA uh, and um, make it easier, make your life easier on a day-to-day -day basis. So, excuse me, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. Before I get into that, you know, kind of some of the, the back history, don't know if you know, first camera came out in 2005, June 2005. 2009 was revolutionary. We came out with the GF series and this was our workhorse for many, many years, right? Uh, we got feedback from you, right? And the reason I mentioned this is when we first started this, this camera to this camera, the reason it's the way it is is because we listened to you. We listened to say, hey, what do we need to put in a camera? And I said, hey, this thing doesn't have a visual camera. Okay, we'll put one in, right? We didn't even know that GPS was gonna be critical in, in regulatory compliance, and, but we put it in there anyway. Some of it we were forward thinking and some of it we were listening. Believe, believe it or not, we listen every now and then. 2017 was unique. It was the first third party certified ATEX camera in the market uh, with our GFX. And then in 2019, we began the path to make methane only detection. To be honest with you, it's a great tool. It's 10 times, five to 10 times less sensitive to pure methane. The reality is what you guys are looking at, oil and gas and methane aren't the same thing. And technology can prove it. And as a technology leader, we've done that. And we've, we've run to a little bit of challenges with respect to methane detection versus true oil and gas and hydrocarbon detection. So what do we did? Uh, there's a couple of little iterations, right? 2014 was our first uh, uh, fixed camera. In 16 was the first time that there was quantitative optical gas imaging through our Providence Photonics partners. And in 2020, 2020 was the first high resolution uh, optical gas imaging camera in the market. But today we actually uh, have, or last year at, the, at this conference, we launched the G-Series camera. And what is the G-Series camera and what does it do? Generally speaking, we looked at our current platform and look at our current portfolio. And we wanted to say, all right, let's make the most advanced replacement of what the industry already has accepted and tells us they like as a camera portfolio, right? We wanted to make, uh, make good better. We also did want to look at groundbreaking technology that meet both today's needs, but maybe tomorrow, right? I looked at this and as an example, I'll talk about quantification in camera. There's no regulation that talks about QOGI. But 15 years ago, nobody knew what a what a, uh, a EV vehicle was, and Tesla started a company that's now the richest man in the world, <laughs> right? So uh, they were ahead of the game with respect to the EV vehicle, and at that time, well before the market was willing to accept an EV vehicle, right? And so we look at that quantification, first ones to put it directly in the camera, and we see, you know what, the industry may not be ready for it today, but we want to get it out there and let people start getting used to it and familiar with it. And then there is a lot of the parts of our camera, the inside of it, that wasn't applicable to today's portfolio, right? The Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, some of the communication protocols. And we wanted to do that and then go above and beyond with touchscreen. Everything's touchscreen nowadays, right? Your iPhone is and, you know, a lot of the things that we were able to put in to try to make the camera easier to use for you, the operator. One thing most people may and may not know is a lot of the things that we did up front was we asked you, right? We asked you, the users of an FLIR camera, what do you not like? A lot of manufacturers won't do that. What is your least favorite thing about our camera? People said I, it, it's fragile. It, the display is exposed, right? The sensitive, the eyepiece display, uh, the viewfinder, uh, if it gets hit from the side, whenever it's up or down, the battery door was kind of kind of wonky. The neck strap needed to be able to attach easier. Quantification, utilizing a separate device was not really uh, this. The wireless communication was missing. What was interesting, and to be honest with you, surprising, was that everybody we talked to, or not everybody, the majority of people we talked to, because keep in mind when you're an engineering company with a facility in Sweden, they want to change everything, right? They want to, you know, we're Swedes. We can make everything more techy and better. Um, but all of you, right? All the operators, the users of our cameras came out and said, I like the way it feels, right? It turns on a handheld pod. The buttons, I don't want you to move the buttons. My guys have got hundred, they're senior operators. They got 1400 hours, 
right? They know where the buttons are. They like where they are. I want that comfortability. Make it better, but I don't want a complete and total revamp like camcorder style or something like that. That was a huge surprise to us. And that, that I don't know if all of them, but almost everybody that we interviewed uh, in this regard had this, this exact same. Uh, this, this exact same piece. So what do we do? We looked at what we have and we just said, let's advance the ergonomics. Let's keep what's going. And I put these in the wrong, right? The touchscreen display, huge four inch touchscreen, very receptive display that provides a user experience. We still have the thumb drive, right? You still have, you can still navigate all of the menus with the thumb, the thumb, uh, the thumb stick, right? So you still have the best of both worlds in our the, the, the viewfinder, people said, man, that was up there. Now, when you close it, you set it down, it's got two sides that help protect the viewfinder. viewfinder. Um, a lot of the buttons that we use, we wanted to make them super easy, very quick. If anybody, when we started showing this camera, everybody said, man, the second I push a button, it's there, right? And we were able to add, in essence, when you add a brand new processor, an Intel inside or whatever you want to call it, we get a lot more receptiveness from the camera. So we're able to do some of that stuff. Um, and the, the display with side mounted flips all the way around. You can close it, hold the camera in your hand and do your analysis right there. So did a number of things. We didn't want to fix what's not broken. This was from you, right? This is from the operators. Make sure that it meets EPA. This was my number one requirement, right? I don't change the detector. What I mean by that is inside the camera, it's the same, the engine, right? The core, the detector of the camera is the same. I'd compare that to if you go, if you have a 10 year old or a 15 year old Tahoe and you go buy a new, new Tahoe, the engine hasn't changed a lot. The transmission hasn't changed a lot, but what used to be a dial is now a touch, right? What used to be a window that does this, and there may be people that don't know what I'm doing, but what used to be a window that does this, now you just hit a button, it goes up automatically instead of having to hold the button. Little things like that. That's what kind of what we did with this. We ensured that it consistently had the ATEX third-party uh, class one div two um, certification that is accepted in the industry, and that the very, very um, uh, appreciated high sensitivity mode the most knocked off trademark that we have, uh, patent that we have um, is, is utilizing the camera and, and doesn't change. But we wanted to make grade even better, right? We added a new GUI with a lot more tools. And the good thing is this aligns with our overall FLIR portfolio. It doesn't matter as much to this, to the Eldar oil and gas industry. We also sell cameras in like the utility industry where they have the same guy that may be using a little handheld camera to look at electrical cabinets that goes out to a substation and looks at sulfur hexafluoride leaks. And there's a lot of consistency in that where somebody uses a $5,000 camera and they grab a $110,000 camera, that user consistency is the same. So we did that with that. I mentioned the four inch team, the ATEX. Uh, the ATEX models, now you can actually change lenses in the field and still be, meet ATEX certification, which was something that we couldn't do originally with a GFX. And we made it durable, right? We listen, right? We want to do this. Don't recommend this, right? But this is a simulated six foot drop uh, through our testing facility where they just beat the crap out of a camera for a day. Um, and yes, it does destroy the camera after time. So if you continually drop it from six feet over and over, I can confirm that pieces will fall out, but we've made it so that it will be durable in, in your day-to-day uh, -day environment. I mentioned the exchangeable lenses. What do lenses give you, right? I'm standing at the same place in these. I'm using my standard lens, 24 degree field of view. If you think about operating envelope, I can cut my operating envelope in half if I use this one. Standing in the same location, looking at the same leak, all I did is pop a lens off and put a new one on, you know, and this is 24 degree, 14 degree. I can see the leak, see it better. Now it almost covers my entire screen with a six degree field of view. And you can see the six degree is such a big lens. <laughs> you can see it in the visual camera right here. So that's what additional lenses give you. Um, it can allow you to, to uh, if you do have challenges with that, with the ATEX class one div two thing, two X lens gives you that capability of getting the same image from about 1.8 times as far away. We advance the digital, right? We understand that 
in Quad O B in uh, in Appendix K, there's a lot more record court, record keeping, and that's not going to change. We needed our cameras to more easily and better communicate with a lot of the third party software. Um, you know, and we don't we have some very basic FLIR software. That's not our core competency. Uh, I understand the basics of regulations, but for me, writing software that may change as the winds of change change from this piece of equipment is the state of Texas, this piece of equipment is Quad OB, this piece of equipment is is Appendix K, and this piece of equipment applies to Travis County, right? And so it, that can be very challenging to do that. There's a lot of people in that room that write those, and now we have very streamlined. One thing we did add, now this is a very, very horrible, horrible marketing name for a cloud-based solution in the oil and gas industry, but it's called FLIR Ignite. Um, and so this is our cloud base. Inside every G-Series camera, if you want it, you, can, you do not have to use it and you can disable it. But if you want it, we provide you with one gigabyte for free. We'll provide you expanded, I think it's like a terabyte for like $100 or $200 a year or something. It's not a whole lot, but we have complete cloud storage. So the second you have that camera on a Wi-Fi, it will upload it. If I have it on Wi-Fi live, it will immediately go to the cloud. And if I don't, and I have it, you know, I'm out doing scans during the day, and I get back to my office and the camera's on, I set it down and it automatically connects to the Wi-Fi of my, of my office. When I turn it on, it's immediately in the cloud as soon as it uploads. We also have a cloud sync, which immediately drops it from the cloud to a desktop. It just says, hey, I'm looking, I'm looking, this folder, I'm waiting, waiting for more stuff to come down. So we have that actually built in. And then we continually, we upgraded some of the GPS characteristics that do help some of the regulatory compliance. This is that, that Ignite uh, cloud-based stuff to try to make it, try to make storage easier. I understand oil and gas customers a lot of times hate the word cloud. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want any cloud holding uh, videos of emissions. I get it. Uh, you don't have to use it, but it's a great unique feature if you want to. Um, What's the difference, right? Hey, Craig, why do you have two different cameras, right? Why do you have a 320 and a 620? Resolution's awesome, right? Bigger's better. No. If we've done studies, if you're 10, 15 feet and in, lower resolution cameras are better at detecting gas leaks. If you're 10, 15, if you're beyond that, sometimes the higher resolutions. Why? Lower resolution means that you have bigger single pixels, right? If you think about, if I need to put 70,000 pixels on this piece of paper or 350,000, it's a big change in how this, that this sits, right? How big each pixel would go on this, okay? And so the bigger the pixel, the more energy I can get, the better I can get at gas sensitivity and gas detection. So we have the best of both worlds. This one is gonna work a little better at detecting at a distance. This one's gonna work better at that true Eldar role of detecting at a common LDAR distance. So uh, the, the piece of this, how does how do these cameras help you, right? I'm just talking now, Craig, get off the sales pitch, right? Tell me how it really helps me do the regulations and I'll get to that. So we looked at the regulations, the first thing we did, and I wanna be transparent. Uh, do these cameras meet the regulations? This is our test. This is in our lab. This is the camera, the GX320. Um, and looking at, this is actually looking at methane. We have to denote the most restrictive gas. A cooled camera, methane is one third as responsive than propane or butane. So we're utilizing methane. It's the most restrictive gas to see with cooled optical gas imaging. With uncooled OGI, which is developed specifically for methane, if you want to be, meet Appendix K, you need to develop your operating envelope for uncooled OGI uh, for propane. You know, whereas methane is five to 10 times less sensitive, propane is about 50 times less sensitive. You may not be able to see it, but you can kind of see it coming just barely out, moving around. It's really hard to see from the back there. The answer to the question is, yes, our uncooled camera might be able to do that. Your operating envelope, damn near zero wind and probably within five feet, right? And we're looking at the right way to develop that. Um, and so we do have that. I'm just being transparent. Um, will you miss a boatload of leaks if you use the wrong technology to meet regulations? Yes. Will somebody, state, federal reg, come behind you and say, hey, um, <laughs> I got a lot of leaks that you're saying you don't have? Yes. Right. So I'm just 
making sure you understand that, that there are other technologies, but I want to be transparent and that we can make them all, right? You give me the box and we'll build it. We'll build to fit in the box um, and do that. So as we look at an operating envelope, um, which one's this? Propane and methane. Um, yeah, this is, this is propane. As I mentioned, you can see how much better you can see methane with a 77. You can see a considerable amount better. So that's why we're more constrictive to that. What does an operating envelope look like? for optical gas imaging cameras from FLIR as it relates to Appendix K. Keep in mind the word operating envelope, and I apologize for doing this in advance, but you guys asked me to do it, was never a thing uh, until I had a number of operators that said, hey, Craig, um, the EPA wrote this, e this Quad OA reg, and they're saying that we got to do a daily test and we don't want to do that. Is there any way you can give me some sort of sliding scale or matrix that says how far I can see with an, uh, an OGI camera to be able to meet quite a way. And we said, we looked at it and we said, okay, well, kind of dependent on some factors, right? 30 mile an hour wind versus a five mile an hour wind, those change a little bit of those factors. A 10 degree delta T versus a two degree delta T may change. Uh, so we put that out and that was the original quad OA operating envelope uh, that we have on the, on the website today. And now the appendix K came out and said, well, we're gonna put a lot more, appreciate you doing that, Clear. We're going to put a lot more restrictions around what you did, uh, but we need to do. We need you to develop an operating envelope, and this is our developed operating envelope with respect to the GX320. The biggest challenge that we had as an as a uh, OGI camera manufacturer was there was a statement in Appendix K that says that you have to create an operating envelope specific to all potential configurations. You might like it in HSM. You might like it in normal. You might like it in the eyepiece. You might like it with the LCD screen. We've got to cover all of those bases to be able to do that. And can you imagine how challenging? You like it with a color palette. You like it with a black and white palette. By definition, your eyesight may be different. So it's very challenging to do this. So what we looked at those configurations, we took the ones that they specifically said and not the ones that they did ETC after, right? We looked at all of those uh, and we put this together. This is the most common way that we can see handheld operations. What they did give us a little reprieve is they said, you're able to use the most restrictive operating envelope. Okay, so if I'm using it handheld, I will probably see less gases than if I'm on a tripod. If I'm using it uh, with HSM, I could be more restrictive than, than doing it uh, with in the normal mode. The reality is HSM is probably the most preferred mode from what you see. So what does this mean? These, all these green pieces, depending upon which lens, we've got to do different for lens at different delta Ts, various delta Ts, this is our operating envelope. Hey, Craig, you know that the regulation's out, right? We got 60 days. Why can't I have this on your website so that I can print it off and I can begin doing my work? And I understand that. The problem is these yellow bars. Right, the yellow bars, the EPA restricted us as camera manufacturers and said, you must have 50% control delta T in your testing facility. And as I mentioned, if I'm this far from that wall and I have a 24 degree field of view, I have from here to here, right? I have 30 feet across and I have 20 feet high. And that means 50%, I've got to have 15 feet by 10 feet of a control delta T. So far, the number one testing facility in optical gas imaging in the world that we utilize out of the UK has told us, I got no clue, Craig. <laughs> we reached out to another company in Texas that is uh, renowned for testing technologies. And they said, yeah, give me 25,000 and I'll tell you maybe if we can do it. So we're still trying to find that right balance of whether or not the yellow is okay. Um, the reality is we have yet to find a testing facility in the world that is telling us that we can effectively and comfortably meet the recommendations of Appendix K. What are the other things that Appendix K asked for? They said, hey, hey, Delta T is a big issue, right? We need Delta T. You know, you need to make sure that you can ensure you have the right Delta T. Now, what I can tell you, if we look at this, and this is direct, I'm not gonna read this out, but you can use a Delta T check function built into the camera. Great, right? There are some cameras out there that different ways to do this. We looked at what delta T is. The delta T is the ambient temperature, right? Subtracted from your background temperature. Background temperature is easy. We have a camera that measures temperature. 
right? So we can get that background temperature really, really easy. The ambient temperature, you just put it into the camera and say, hey, it's I, I, like, it's, I don't know, it's 85 degrees in here right now. Maybe it's just some of this. Um, so this is what that, that looks like. And so we put that in the camera. This is how Delta T affects. Does Delta T really have an effect on optical gas imaging? I think this video kind of shows that it does. Now, I will admit this, and I disagree with the Delta T for this. If this video were in HSM, and I wish I had that, you'd see the leak right here. No problem, right? HSM removes almost all of the Delta T restraint for optical gas imaging. I don't think they took that into account. I think that legally they can't take that into account. While every camera manufacturer has knocked off our patented HSM, the EPA can't write a regulation around a patent from a single camera manufacturer. So that I think that would change this dramatically as it can relate. That's why we're using HSM in our operating envelope. So what did we do? We put a feature in the camera. There's a P button on the side. One of the things that you can choose with that P button is a Delta T check. So what I do is I tap it on. And I go into the camera first, set the delta T setting, right? What's my ambient temperature? And I want a two degree, a three degree, a five degree, what delta T I want. And I just simply tap a button on the side of the camera and it says, all the red pixels have insufficient delta T to see a leak. If I'm looking at this video, do you think this are enough insufficient or do you think I can get a different angle to very quickly and easily inspect this to meet Appendix K requirements? Probably the latter, right? I'll show this image because this is important. We do a quick image check and not just a check mark, right? We allow you to look at the entire image to see, is that a sufficient delta T? There are some cameras in there that just say, I'm gonna assume that my background temperature is the average of my field of view. I'm just gonna take one temperature and I'm gonna tell you whether it's different from my weather station that's over here. You tell me whether that would work this header that's moving off to the side, I can easily see it. If that header or happened to be a blowdown valve, would you be able to see it according to delta T configurations of the camera, or delta T assumptions of the camera? More than 50% of this is probably good delta T. 33% of this is probably bad delta T. So I'd be cautious if you don't have an image confirmation of what delta T is, we listen, we read the regs, and we put stuff in here to try to make your life and your everyday inspections to meet regulations easier. Does it apply to Appendix K? Yes. Does it apply to Quad OB? No. Could this help you in other aspects? Yeah, yeah it really could. GPS. Appendix K section, nine, section 90 says, you've got to ensure that all the components are monitored. Okay, great. What do you got to do there? One of the things you can do is capturing GPS coordinates along the survey path. Wouldn't it be nice if a camera company put a GPS in there? Well, we did in 2009 before we even thought about what GPS would mean to an optical gas imaging camera. Now we have this, and we had customers directly in this uh, at this conference that said to us, hey, Craig, I want breadcrumbs. That's what they called it, right? I want a GPS path. So what do you have to do with Quad A, Quad B, and uh, Appendix K? I've got to develop my site path. This is where I walk to ensure that I have inspected. This is pre-done. This is in your reporting, right? This is your, your, your inspection plan. I forgot what it's called, observation path, okay? Did you do that with the camera? Well, our cameras are set up. The second you turn it on, you have to turn it off. But if you buy a camera that's been manufactured from FLIR since March of 2020 or beyond, it has GPS, and this includes the legacy GFs, it has GPS, data logging built in. You can choose whether you want it to log data every 10 seconds or every 60 seconds. And this is what it looks at. This is my house. I turned my OGI camera on. I walked out my front door, walked around the block, walked back around the cul-de-sac, jumped back in the jumped back in the garage. So this is exactly, turn the camera off, turn the camera off right here, right? This is the exact capabilities. And now this is just a data log file. You don't have to do anything with it. You can just keep it off to the side for a daily data log or however many times you use this, but we have just an Excel data log file. Really, really low format, super easy to use, and it can help. A lot of you may already use Eldar software that does this, but wouldn't it be nice to have that data log file from the piece of equipment that is actually being used to meet the regulations? That's a huge advantage there. We also, and we're still learning, this is a new feature that we have within our thing, it's called inspection route. 
And what this, this is built more for our electrical and mechanical operations where uh, I can walk up to a site and say, I'm standing here, right? And I know this is a component. I can even pull up a reference image of what this component is supposed to look like without any thermal anomalies. And I can see what, you know, what the definition, what it is. And I'm still looking at the right way to do this, but there is a potential chance and we can work with a work with an operator that's willing to, you know, kind of play with this and allow us to help investigate this is I'm standing here in Appendix K. If I'm standing here and looking here and I know that my observation path, my predefined is this is what I have to do. I've got 10 components and it just says 10 components, 10 seconds, 12 components, 24 seconds, right? Because you're over 10, you've got to do two seconds per. 10 components do this, right? So you have that capability. We're still looking into this, uh, but this is a potential way for us to help meet some of that stuff. You're going to know where you're going to stand and look at these components. It could potentially help that building in some of that maximizing of inspection efficiency. Other things, one of the reprieves in the final reg was that it don't you don't have to have the video. You don't need a 10 second video of your leaks. You don't need that. What you need is you need either an image or a video that depicts the leak. Now, how many of you have ever used an OGI camera and the second you hit save on an image, what happens? You don't see crap, right? It's always moving. It's hard to see what's going on. But what we did is we looked at that. Can we do something in the camera because we're touchscreen now to make it easier for you to just save an image? and not save a video. So what we did is we added a thing called sketch on infrared. So if you're using the camera in IR image mode and not IR video mode, right? Camera mode versus video mode, and you hit get to something, you can say every time I hit save, I want you, Mr. Camera, to pull up and remind me that I need to draw a picture on that camera. I need a sketch. In this case, all I did is say this, I can't, ah, back, backwards here, hang on. I can't see where this is leaking, right? It's a paused video. If I were to play this video, I would see it's the top right corner of this. Now keep in mind, the controllers aren't allowed to leak anyway, the new reg, so won't go there with that. But I can draw an area, I can draw a circle, I can put a happy face, whatever it is, I can just simply draw on the camera, make it super easy. Something unique to the camera is something where, again, we're trying to look forward thinking. The first reg said 10 seconds. So what did we do? We looked at this and, and um, I don't know if anybody in here manages a number of Eldar operators. I'm just curious. Anybody manage like more than at least a couple, three, four? Every video is different, right? One guy does it in HSM. One guy does it in normal. One guy does it in visual. One guy does it in two seconds in visual. And by the way, if you've ever seen a video from somebody using an OGI camera, it's like this, right? If I want to go from infrared to HSM to visual, it looks like this. Infrared. <laughs> HSM, you know, moving all around visual, right? If you've ever looked at a video, it's all over the damn place. Wouldn't it be nice if the camera could just do that for you? So we added a new feature in the camera. It's called multi-recording. I set this up to say how many seconds of digital camera in what order you can do IR first, HSM first, digital first. If you're in HSM and you want it to record in all three modes, doesn't matter. You don't have to switch. It just hit record and it records it. So I can do a couple seconds in digital infrared and HSM. This is a CO2 camera. I'm looking at my puppy on the floor, right? This is what happens. She's wondering what's going on. This is normal. You can see her breathing. And then I put it in HSM for two seconds, or maybe this is four seconds. And then I, may, I wanted to make sure I get a visual representation. There's no movement. The camera inside just toggles that. And why do we put this in here? One, it was easier. Originally, the regulation in 2021, before we even launched this camera, said you had to have 10 seconds. The other advantage of this is four, four, two. I had 10 seconds of actual recording with that video right there, right? So you have consistency in the regulation. Even if it's not regulatory driven, you have consistency within that. And you could have, you know, if you have the new cameras, you can say, everybody just needs to do multi-rec. When you see a leak, you push go. And I want you to, uh, you know, I want you to do that. Or you could do the sketch on infrared. You have consistency in what you want to do there. While we don't know where this is going to go in regulatory framework, we have proposed comments to subpart W that we should feel as though if you do want to use direct measurements of emissions through subpart W, that quantitative optical gas imaging should 
be allowed and included. Um, this allows what we've done in this new one is we've removed the third party device. We removed the tablet that you either had to tether to the camera or post analyze. Now I will make a statement. A tablet has a big old computer in it, right? It's all a tablet is. It has more processing power than what we can put inside that little black camera we've got on the, on the tripod out there, right? So the tablet still has some advantages. If you wanted to tether or do Q mode, you do still have some advantages and we're gonna have that tablet working with the new camera uh, by the end of the month. But if all you wanted is to go out there and put it on a tripod and I wanna quantify, there you go. You just put it in this quantification, you let it run for 20 seconds and at the end of it, it spits out this video. This will now say what gas you've used as your predominant gas. In this case, we were 28 scuff of methane. Both of these were methane. This one was 192 scuff of methane. And it's not only that, it's a data point. All those really smart people that make Eldar software, it's just a metadata file, a single like digit, kind of like a spot number. It's a number that they can put into their software. I will mention some other FLIR uh, advantages. I want to highlight that this acoustic, not only ours, Every acoustic technology in that room is not EPA approved. Why? It's super easy, right? You just look at it and pops up a, a really quick colorized uh, dot on a visual camera and man, that's super easy. They will work. There are times that this is 99% as effective as an OGI camera and easier to use. But there's also times where it's 20%. This is not, this technology is not based on foundational science of hydrocarbons. This technology was invented for compressed air gas leak, or compressed air leak detection, right? Having compressors and all this compressed air, the amount of money that these huge manufacturing facilities are losing in compressed air loss is, is outrageous. That's what it's made. Then they realize, hey, we can see gas leaks with it. Keep in mind that they're pressurized gas leaks. A lot of the leaks that we see, if you got an open thief hatch, is there any pressure in that leak? If you got a blowdown valve, that's leaking and not supposed to? Is there any pressure? Are you ever gonna see it with this? So you might see 99%, you might see 10, 20%. You never know where that gap is in between. It has to be pressurized. So I just wanna mention that. Another new technology we've come out in the last year or so is temperature only. This is not OGI. No, we don't have a $4,000 OGI camera, but this is an this is an EX ATEX rated, an EX rated low end IR camera that you could use in a refinery to have an infrared looking at motors, looking at pumps, maybe electrical, walking around anywhere and just needing, not needing that hot work permit for an infrared camera. Looking at the acoustic, again, superior result. This is us versus, not to be transparent, but us versus the other people in the, uh, in the industry today or in the uh, other room. Um, super quiet lab environment. These are the results of independent third party testing. Super easy to use, basic field operation. It does do some quantification. I don't know how accurate that quantification is. To be honest with you, it's not something under my portfolio, but it gives you a relatively, you know, a relatively good estimate of quantification. Here's an example of why I think that you need to be careful with acoustic. Look how easy this is to use, right? <laughs> so I got a visual camera, it's kind of black and white, and I got a I got a really quick red dot. Super easy. Like that's all I need except for the fact that, tell me how many leaks are here. One here and one here. It didn't find this guy, it only found this guy, right? So I just be cautious on the acoustic side. We are here, we've got both technologies within our portfolio. We wanna support the growth of technology to do your, the jobs of, of, of helping you either be safer, reduce emissions or, 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 or make more money by you know, keeping your equipment running, um, but we do have that. Where do I see this as being a, a potential game changer for ours or any of the acoustic stuff? If you've got to get to remove you know, the pneumatic controllers going to instrument air, now you have a technology. ROJ cameras, you're gonna have a huge instrument air leak, it's not gonna see it. <laughs> There's no hydrocarbons in there. But you could use this acoustic technology to help streamline what you're trying to do. Maybe it's through your operations teams, Maybe it's through your Eldar team while they're out there uh, on site uh, and doing what they're doing. But this is where I envision a, a, this acoustic technology to really fit into a multi-tool portfolio uh, for you in what you're trying to do in the industry to meet regulations. 
The last thing is we did talk about regulatory requirements of training. Uh, while I while I don't agree that the regulatory framework should have been written around the person using it and not around the technology, right? Tell the technology what they can do. Historically, Method 21 never really said that you had to, you know, this is exactly how you have to get trained and how often and all of this. You got to have somebody following you with a, you know, with binoculars and a scope and a stopwatch and all that stuff. But well before we knew this was coming out, was when we started training operators to do OGI cameras. We began doing that in late 2005 or early 2006. And we have been, you know, the leader in training people how to use an OGI camera ever since. I'm curious, is anybody here ITC trained? And thank you. Yeah. So we do have this. One thing that's different, COVID was horrible in most cases, but we did realize with COVID that the virtual training, it actually worked better than we thought. My guy, my uh, training director said, nope, no way, no how are we ever going to do virtual? We're not doing it. We're traveling around. People don't get it. We're not even going to do uh, uh, fundamental courses, which are online. So this changed. And over COVID, we realized that looking at somebody on a computer screen looks it is it, it, not the same as doing it in person, but it, you can get similar effects. I like the in-person classes because I can learn from you and I can learn from you, right? I can learn from my peers as much as I, you know, maybe not as much, but a, a fair amount is what I can learn from them. So we do have these, we have regional courses, virtual. We can do on-site options uh, at your facility. If you have enough people that need to be certified for optical gas imaging, huge opportunity. One advantage there is that you guys have leaks. <laughs> if you do an on-site course um, and, uh, you know, you can actually go outside and do some of that you know, actual field experience while you're doing some of the training stuff. Um, we can't do that at a hotel where we do some of the training, where, where we kind of have to do some of the trainings. That's what I have. Are there any questions, comments? And I appreciate the people that were willing to sit in here for two, two episodes of uh, Craig Speaks. Um, any questions, comments, observations? Yes. They, I, I was told by the guy in Canada that took that, that they did what they, that was the, that was the first time they took an image and found that they did look around and couldn't find the other leak. That was, that's what I was told. It could have been interference, acoustic interference from one was a little bit bigger than the other. I don't know. Uh, I was told by the guy that took that, that yes, I took that, I, that same thing, took it at that angle. As I got straight on, it still only saw the one. Yeah. Good question. Any other ones? Yes, sir. Yes, I mean, it, it doesn't care what kind of gas, what kind of, as long as it's pressurized, right? It doesn't have to be very, uh, you know, super pressurized, but as long as there's some pressurized, yes. Um, there, I say yeah, yes, for what, what gas, you said nitrogen? There are some, some gases, and I don't remember, that have a density change that makes it, that makes the sound, I think it's too low, like a super heavy gas. Uh, may have may have some challenges, but I believe I've I've seen nitrogen as one of the ones. Um, I'm not an expert in the acoustic world of of where that density changes. It changes the depth of whether you're talking low or high, right? And, and and how heavy that gas is. So there is a some sort of correlation to the density of that gas, the molecular weight and the density of that gas. So I don't know I don't know holistically that, but I I, I do know that we've used it in hydrogen and nitrogen and been able to be successful in both of those applications. Okay, okay, August of 2005, yeah. That may have been one of the first courses. It was what? Uh, gas finder? Very good, thank you for your, for that. Well, thank you, uh, I'll, oh yes, Mike. Well, and not only that, the X620, if you do want to have a 620 in your fleet, but you prefer 320s, you maybe have one camera that you want to maybe do further out detection. The 3X320 and X620 lenses are interchangeable, right? So if you had, let's say, two 3, X320 cameras, new, new GX320 cameras, 
and you wanted one in one 620 x620 you can actually interchange those lenses uh, uh, between the cameras yep thank you uh, feel free to ask any more questions stick around if you have that I, I do appreciate the time I know some of you I